welcome to Chaotic Chris TV. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston, and our guest today is a guitar founding guitarist, uh, Tony uh, Spillman from the band Spillers. Now, um, I'm assuming Tony, the name of the band is kind of a play on your name. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's where it came about. Yeah, and then you know it just kind of you know evolved a bit from there. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, branding because um, you know when I when I first heard the name Spillage, oh, that seems kind of seems kind of interesting, but then you know it makes sense and. I, I love it. It's so simple, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, that was kind of the thing, you know, as, as I was asking, we were talking, you know, previously, I was asking about, you know, your show about riff. And, you know, uh, yeah. if you know anything about me, Jason, you know, I talk about Spillage as being a riff rock band, you know? Yeah. And so riff rock bands, you know, really started getting really solid in that early to mid 70s, you know? Yeah. So some of my favorite stuff was a band's were that one word name, you know, that was yeah. just like the first Rush record was just, yeah. Rush, you know, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I mean, even, even like Black Sabbath, you know, it's Black Sabbath, but everybody calls it Sabbath, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. You know, but, you know, just stuff like that. It was just something like uh, it, uh, it was a one word name that I thought and it worked. And I a, mean, lot of, a lot of times, like you said, those, those are kind of the best, the, the simplest names, you know, Rush, Kiss. Um, you know, Doc and whatever. I mean, Aerosmith people. People remember it. It's easy to remember. And um, and another thing, when you come up with a band name, which I know is the hardest thing to do, um, there's probably not even one other band named Spillage. So you don't, you know, you can copyright it, and and you got you got your name. <laughs> well, there is a few. There's a there's a, a punk band in the UK called Spillage, and they're actually kind of not actually kind of cool. Like I'm surprised, but they're they're pretty cool bands. Sounds pretty cool. And um, there's a there's a spillage village band. Uh, they're kind of uh, but they're not kind of like rock and roll or anything. Yeah, yeah. So you know he, you know the band was going to be called Faded, uh, F A D E D. You know because yeah. I was getting older, you know type of thing. And uh, it turned out there was like thirty faded bands around the world. So I was like, eh. And that's how we coined the phrase spillage and we had moved forward with spillage. So, but that was a while ago. That was back like uh, 2007, I think it was. I was living in Arizona at the time, but when I had moved back to Chicago, uh, you know, because people get this, there was a gap and, you know, they said spillage started and then, and it really did. But then when I moved back to Chicago, I played five years in the band Earth and Grave of uh, that. Um, uh, you know, with Rachel Barton Pine. And so I did that for five years. And so that kind of put a pause on that whole thing. So let me ask you, Tony, I mean, that's uh, quite a difference. Um, you know, Arizona and Chicago, very different places. So um, what took you from Arizona uh, back to Chicago? Well, uh, I was married when I left Chicago and moved to Arizona. And um, when I moved out there, my wife was working uh, for the for the federal government. You know? oh, okay. okay. And so I uh, was doing a lot of guitar teching and working, uh, traveling with bands. I, you know, I did a, a ministry tour uh, as a guitar tech. Well, I didn't do the whole tour. I had got yeah. sick. But and then I worked, uh, did a prong tour, The Power of the Damager. I did that tour. Then I did off and on. I worked uh, trouble tours. You know, I did their Simple Mind Condition tour. Uh, and then some other, you know, bands that you may not have ever heard of, but no, I, that's what I did prior, yeah. That's pretty cool because, you know, a, a lot of um, people that want to, you know, uh, get into a band and, you know, get in the music industry, they, they fail to realize, I think, that um, that's a great way to get a start. You know, I mean, even tech and for other people, you see how it's done. You, um, you know, you make your connections. So, and you, you might mention somebody, you know, hey, I play in a band too. Oh, really? What's the name of the band? And who knows? It could lead to... Oh, you know, well, we need an opening band. You think your band could? Open? You just never know, right? Right. Well, you know, uh, the the teching job and the you know roading, whatever, whatever term people want to call it. You know, it really is a young man's game though, because it's a very physically demanding. Sure, job, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it's tough. Now, it, you know, and then there's different levels as well. Like the ministry tour was the only really big production tour that sure. I did with with buses and. and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, big production, you know, semis, uh, all the other tours were, you know, uh, you know, van tours or, uh, you know, RVs, you know, you're on it. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, it's what it was, but on the smaller tours, uh, you, they usually only have one or two techs, you know, yeah, that yeah. are on tour them. So you have to be able to do multiple things, you know, yeah. and, so it, it's not a job for the pain of heart, you know. And I, I mean, I'm glad you pointed out that out, uh, Tony, because I never even thought of that myself. And I'm sure, like anything, 
there's all different levels and i'm sure it's a very different type of gig um you know teching for a guy that's playing a you know a little blues club compared to like a ministry show where he's a major band and it you know they're playing an arena and they got like you know if you're part of the sound crew or whatever you know or even even the guitar tech you got to make sure the guitar can be heard on all uh, all sides of arena you know it, it's a much bigger uh, well know, it's a team venture when you're working on a major production like that yeah. it's a team venture you just you need to just do your your role you know yeah, you, don't, yeah. you don't think about anybody else's gig you know you just make sure that your gig you know goes smoothly you yeah, know when, you, when you're working on a ministry gig uh, too I, I i'd imagine though like you say you got to be responsible for your your role or your you know your part but if you mess up your part or you're not paying attention, um, just you not being on your game or you not uh, being uh, paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing, that could affect the whole show. Or that could, you know, even if it's yeah, a well, that only happens once or twice and then you're fired. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, you know, you you have to be on your game or or, or don't do that gig. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, to, and to be fair, you know, um, that gig was a little bit over uh, what I you know, because at that time I was still wanting to be a player. Sure, you know, sure. that was my job, and and you know, and, and at that time you, you I made an okay living, you know, doing yeah, 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 you know, but um, but yeah, it, it, but it is a young man's job, like I said. Oh, sure, sure. You know? and, now uh, let me ask you, Tony, um, how old were you when you um, first started playing the guitar? And I, I always love to ask people, like, um, since you're a guitar player. Um, talk about like why did you know the guitar was instrument for you? I mean, uh, why was that your instrument of choice? Well, uh, actually, uh, you know, when I got into music, I've always just I, I was just wanting to be a singer songwriter, but oh, I wow. started early and and then when I became 13, 14 and started getting in bands or performing and playing in bands, um, you know, wanting to be a singer, I was you know, puberty and couldn't sing and had that you know, that kid, yeah, 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 yeah. So I started playing bass first because. Uh, you know, I wanted to be able to be involved in music. And in the 70s, bass players, you know, were pretty hard rocking musicians, man. You know what I mean? They weren't just, uh, you know, bopping around. You know, they were really, you know, attacking, at least the music that I was yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but however, the basses was a wonderful instrument. I played it for about a year. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't able to really construct songs the way I wanted to be. Yeah. I wanted to be a songwriter, you know. And well, I was already a songwriter, but I wanted to, you know, continue to write songs. And I felt uh, that the guitar was a good rock and roll instrument. And then again, like I was saying, uh, you know, uh, Jason, I was in the, getting into that riff rock, you know. Uh, you know, it's just really, you know, and that's where it was, you know. When I was a teenager, it was, you know, Ted Nugent, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, you know. Yeah. Scorpions, Judas Priest. I mean, the list goes on, but you know, they all had that. The Doobie Brothers, you know, just these yeah. great freaking riffs, you know. Well, you know, Tony, I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day about Judas Priest. Um, until recently, you know, um, I heard like, um, you know, a lot of the uh, popular albums, you know, like like most people, but I never heard the the uh, first album, Rockerola, and I happened to come across that on YouTube and was checking out the entire album. And what's interesting for people who haven't checked it out before, I urge you to because number one. While Rob Halford was a vocalist on that album, um, it was it was uh, the previous vocalist Al Atkins that wrote wrote all that stuff. So but the songs are written with another vocalist in mind. And if you listen to Rockerola, it's uh, it sounds nothing like uh, Judas Priest sounds today. You know, they're all into metal and being the metal gods and all that. It sounded much more like a progressive rock band. Right. Well, you know, and you're absolutely correct, Jason, because. Uh... You know, they were still that product of the 70s. Yeah. Where that, that 70s, that's early 70s when that was written and all that. Uh, that was a progressive type of a, a hard rock was progressive-ish, you yeah. know, at those times. You know, uh, like the band Sweet, you know, that everyone says, well, they were a glam band, but they were amazing musicians, too. I mean, they yeah. had yeah. the cornball songs. But, but um, you know, if you look at Judas Priest and you see Sad Wings of Destiny, which is my favorite record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know that still really got some psychedelic elements to it. You know, um, it wasn't. Uh, you know, it wasn't until you know Hellbent for Leather is where yeah. you know, it was the metal metal. You know, sure, sure, metal, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and don't get me wrong, I love that stuff too. But um, you know what I liked about that hard rock or acid rock or riff rock of the '70s that we talked about is is that. People were they were still constructing sure. like songs. They had their own uniqueness. Sure. Yeah. 
that's one of the things that here at Spillage we try to aspire to do. But, you know, not that, the, you know, the thrash era and all that was bad, because I like some of that, too. Yeah, but yeah. All the rock and roll was so diverse at that time. I mean, you know, a lot of things, you know, and, you know, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath was doing some B-sides. UFO were doing B-sides, you know, between the walls. And, yeah. You know, just different jazzy, melodic pieces that, you know, today, you know, I mean, you know, if you're not on 11 all the time, then you're not there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're aware of this, Tony, but talking about Sabbath, I mean, um, probably one of the main reasons, I don't know if you're aware of this, that, um, they were considered riff rock back in the day, not not only because of the riff master Tony Iommi, but for right, the right. fact for the fact that Geezer Butler, the bass player, he wrote all the lyrics, not Ozzy. Yep, yeah, no, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, you know, I I love Ozzy and God bless him. I wish him all the best, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, he, <laughs> I don't think he had no scruples after. Well, well you, you even look at um, his his solo work, which is very different from Sabbath. The, the thing you can say about Ozzy, he's always surrounded himself with um, talented musicians. They weren't just talented on their musician, but they were great songwriters. All right, Bob Daisley, who, you know, wrote yeah, yeah. the first record. You know, he and Randy. Yeah. 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 So, and, now let's talk about um, your band, Spillage. Now, the, the new album um, is out. It's called Faith Force. So talk a little bit about, about the new album and, um, you know, can people get physical copies or is it oh, just... Yeah. yeah. Well, Phase 4 is our fourth record. Um, it is, uh, you know, uh, has eight songs on it. The title track, Phase 4, is about a mad scientist. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the artwork is done by our bass player, Billy McGuffey. And the um, the model for the Phase 4 cover uh, is uh, our keyboard player, Paul, uh, oh. who I always call the our mad scientist. And, you know, yeah. he's one of those smarter than the average bear guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, the coin yogi you know so um but anyway uh so um but it's really about a mad scientist you know and they're trying to create you know the ultimate robot or a you know ai type thing because you know it's kind of prevalent in this time age and stuff and uh so you know that's kind of how we kick off the record uh then you know each song um i think is diverse in itself um, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's real heavy metal or oh, no, no. we are considered heavy metal doom. Sure, but sure. Really, uh, as a fourth record, I would say it's probably really our most rock and roll record. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you agree with this, but this is kind of how I describe it. Um, cause I'm tr I was trying when I was listening to the album last night, prepping for this, um, I was trying to think, okay, what does this remind me of? What does it sound like? And first of all, I'll say, it doesn't really sound like anything out there. What I mean is, uh, it, it, it's a very hard thing to do, but I think you guys accomplished this, which is um, thank you that you got your own kind of original sound. Like I can't sit here and tell people it sounds like Pantera or you know um, Metallica. You got your own kind of thing going, and and you're so right. It's not exactly what I would call metal. It's got a little bit of an edge. So there's elements of that. There's elements of hard rock, um, and, and you kind of really have developed your own. Um, your own sound here, I think. And that's that's a very hard thing to do. I don't know if that's something you set out to do or that's just kind of the way the songs came out. Well, um, when, you know, I had this plan of, like I said, this riff rock idea. This is the, this is the direction that I was after. And, yeah. you know, like when you were talking about Ozzy, about surrounding himself with good musicians, well, you know, um, that's what a good manager does, you know. Yeah. A good manager in all areas, they, they, they put good people around them to create what yeah. their vision is, you know, yeah. and so that's what I was able to do. Now, the cool thing about with Spillage is that all these cats in Spillage, I've known since probably 1978. So we go wow. back. like Way years. back, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, now uh, Elvin, of course, you know, he's been in the band for eight years, but I've known him for about 10. Wow. Uh, he wow. came up inside the Philadelphia area, and I, and I knew he could sing, uh, but I didn't really know that he was such a great lyricist, and so yeah. he's written and constructed all the songs from the second record third and fourth so um so when when we we call it spillagizing the music so yeah, like yeah. i i pick, pick four songs that i bring in nick brings in four songs uh we could put them into a format changing mm -hmm. key tempos and then we start to add the colors like you know like painting you know sure sure, sure. so and in each individual has it their own elements you know paul the keyboardist is a 
He plays classical piano. He's a music teacher at a Catholic school in Chicago. Wow, wow. Um, very well versed. Uh, Billy McGuffey is a very prog influenced individual, a great bass player, a Getty Lee freak, you know. Wow, wow. Kind of things, you know, really into it. And, uh, you know, Chris uh, Martin, uh, the drummer, we call him the world's largest guard now because uh, he looks like it, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. he um, he's such a, a a colorful drummer. Uh, it's um, I would say that, and I'm not just saying this. Yeah. I think he has some of the very best transitions uh, in the in the business. You know, wow. uh, his drumming uh, is an extension of of, of music. You know, it's yeah. he's just. He's not just pounding it out, you know. I mean, everything has its place, you know, and, and I admire that greatly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh... you know, um, uh, Nick uh, Boza Darvin, the uh, lead guitarist, um, you know, just a phenomenal 70s, uh, you know, Michael yeah. Shanker uh, type yeah. of uh, uh, rich, right. more yeah. influenced uh, type of a lead guitarist. So yeah. we all have those different elements that we throw in and that we talk about how we want to approach uh, the song. and that's it, how it sounds like it's very collaborative. And let me ask you, like um, you mentioned at the top interview that um, even to this day, you, you like to think of yourself more as a songwriter. Um, um, so I, I imagine you come up with the guitar parts and the singer pretty much for the most part writes the lyrics. Do you ever get involved with writing the lyrics? Well, I, I well, you know, on this last record, I, on the very first Village record, I wrote all the music except for the cover. Um, of Cliff Richards cover Devil Woman, of course, yeah. you know. So. Yeah, yeah. I wrote I wrote everything on that, and then you know put the band together for the most part. And I think you can hear that. I think it's a little sterile. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, you know nothing about it. Voltar Keller is a fabulous vocalist. You know, with Kumran Records, a great friend of mine, and you know Billy or Willie uh, uh, Max, a bass player and backup vocalist, but another great musician. But you know, it was it was it sounded like that to me. You know, it sounded like it was just uh you know one thing when blood of angels the second record came together everything changed the whole element yeah. because that's where we decided to move forward with hence we bring in elvin rodriguez at vocals and then billy mcguffey uh, on bass at back of vocals um and that's when we really started to uh expand in what uh, you know uh, everyone's view of what it was now obviously i had to be the executive the uh, director <laughs> But then I also had people like Bruce Franklin of Trouble producing all wow. the records as wow. well. So, wow. You know, thing with that, we well, yeah, he's, he's been a great friend of mine. So yeah. yeah, so I had again a good manager. I think put a good team around me. You know, and so and here's what I was curious to uh, want to know. Like going back to the first record where you pretty much wrote everything yourself, um, and you're kind of just getting to know the band, putting the band together. Um, like the first time you guys went in the studio and recorded, I was curious if um, you were a little more critical of the singer in the sense that that's not how I wrote that song to be sung or um, that's not how I hear the song in my head as opposed to because he's more involved with the songwriting now, you each kind of are allowed to do your thing where you don't have to be as maybe so, so critical of what everybody else is performing it. Well, the thing is, is this, is that, you know, um, I, I want to make sure that I allow everybody to feel that freedom, of you course. know, yeah. You know, I don't want to I don't want to try to manipulate someone's thought process or anything. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that with the guys with the given Elvin idea. See, like Nick will give Elvin idea or all of the guys are kind of give, hey, let's do a song about this or let's work on something like this. Uh, you know, and and Elvin will, will construct or, you know, craft something up. Now, uh, the song again, uh, the last song on the phase four mm -hmm. record, um, he and I collaborated on the lyrical content on that. <laughs> Excuse me. Musically, the, yeah. it was written by Nick, the other guitar player. Uh -huh. But it was a song, uh, you know, that I had started lyrically writing, uh, you know, uh, you know, during a, a kind of a tough time going on in my life, and uh, and I brought it to Elvin, and he, uh, you know, took it, and you know, again, did you know, made it up, and um, yeah. and it came out beautifully. And and I love like um, you're talking about coming up, have it being kind of a concept project, and. Um, a lot of my favorite stuff, you know, Alice Cooper that I grew up on, uh, those were all like concept type albums. So my question is, so when you decide you're going to come up with a concept, I mean, um, did you already kind of have the idea what the concept was going to be? Do you have to kind of you come up with the concept and then you write these songs based around your storyline? Or Well, we're living in really precarious times right now, Jason. You yeah, know, yeah. Everywhere, as well as, you know, 
you yeah. know, out there on the coast here it would be in Chicago. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of dialogue out there to grab sure, from, sure. You know, yeah, yeah. and then also trying to stay prevalent, you know, in the world, you know, because yeah. you, know, you know, people sometimes will look at us and like, oh wow, those, those cats are old, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and our music, you know, I, we've been we've been uh, criticized a bit for being like grandfather rock or something yeah. like a grandfather metal, and eh, I don't really give a you, you know, yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah. but. but uh, so. Um, but you know, we, we do want to stay like prevalent of what kind of is going on in the world. Yeah. So, you know, and there you go with the, you know, rise of the machine, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, on phase four and that's all about, you know, AI and, you know, the, the, all that, um, that that's going on, you know, with that whole thing. And it's very scary. Yeah. I mean, AI, I mean, I, 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 I can't really even grasp the concept of, it. I mean, I, I've been hearing uh, musicians talk about that, um, there, there are AI programs to write songs or, you know, like a, a musician doesn't even have to be alive and they could kind of base a song on his voice or what, what it would have sounded like, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, you know, the, a lot of things have changed, you know, in one of these previous interviews, we were talking about the difference between, uh, you know, analog tape recordings sure. and digital recordings and, you know, and, uh, yeah, and now, you know, I mean, you know, not with the, you know, Pro Tools and all that, you know, you can do a segment and then you just copy and paste, you know, it's copy, paste. I mean, copy. you talk about, you talk about getting old, well, I'll, I'll, I got to tell you, Tony, I, I do, an, I do another show called um, Bart Boris's Time Machine with this other guy, and, and it's it's a fun kind of a, kind of a retro, um, it's kind of a retro show where we, we talk about our favorite TV shows and movies and stuff, and, oh, and, and music, it's a little bit of everything, and and sometimes what comes up is we like to kind of to give people an idea of what the world was like then. Um, talk exactly about that. I mean, j just talking about in our lifetimes, I mean, people listening to this, they might not even have a clue what, what I'm talking about. But, um, I mean, we have seen so much change in technology. Do, do you remember when, um, I mean, just to start with, not even tech technology-wise, but do uh, you remember when you used to go to a record store to buy your music? Do you remember when they used to have pay phones? I, I dare you to find a payphone on the street now. Or remember when they had pagers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, man, I remember rabbit ears on the television with uh, tin foil wrapped on them. Yeah. So yeah. I go back a little way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the telephone cord that was twenty feet long and that yeah, was yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You remember when we used to make TV that didn't have remote control? Uh, I mean, all that. I, and the, how you really know you're getting old is when you watch movies and, and you see, like, in the background, like, uh, stores. And you're like, I know where that is. Oh, that's not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, and even talking about technology, the, the way we're doing the interview, who would have ever thought that, you know, I mean, um, I've been doing interviews like this for a long time when I started. You know, you do the old school way. You do them over the telephone, and you get a little right. tape recorder. Now, now, I mean, just thought the, the thought that you're in Chicago and I'm I'm in Los Angeles. I mean, you don't even have to, um, and we're able to see each other. I mean, just just how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. If I can figure out a way to not make the screen look so green, maybe it's like all the cornfields I live around. <laughs> well, at least we can see. At least we can hear you. Because I, I tell you, um, you want to hear a real funny story? Like I, I was telling you before we went on there here. Um, just this last year, um, I had a friend kind of encourage me to learn how to do these um, Zoom interviews, and he really encouraged me. He says, I'll tell you what, let's do a practice session, and, and I'll, I'll try to teach you how to do it. And cool. and, and I got to thank him because I really enjoyed doing it. But what's fun is each interview is totally different depending on where a person's coming from, what's in the background. Each one has its own personality. But, um, of course, you ever hear that famous phrase, if anything could possibly go wrong, it will. Very first time I tried to do one of these and I have a guest on, the computer in the middle of the um, when it's time to interview the person wants to update, and so <laughs> so we had to reschedule for like you know another thirty minutes later. But but again, you know it's it's a learning process. Um, and so now let's talk about you're from Chicago. That's where you're from. Um, now I know um, for many years, even to this day, Chicago has been a place that's always been known. Uh, Mainly for when you're talking about music, the blues. Uh, so I know there's a huge blues scene there, but what is the metal or even rock scene like there these days? Well, I think it's you know a, a kind of a lot like probably most other places. Uh, cover bands, tribute bands, pretty much dominate uh, like the, the 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 
the good clubs, you know, like the the, the middle, yeah. but pretty good clubs. Um, there there are some clubs that you know just you know play a lot of uh, original music, which is which is still good too. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, uh, sadly, you know, I just work. Uh, you're familiar with the band Trouble, of course. We spoke. Sure, about sure, it. sure. Yeah. They just have played a show this last weekend in Chicago. Uh, you know, and I still work for Bruce, so I tech the show for him. Wow. And uh, he. Um, and I think they had like about three and a half, four hundred people there. And it was a good bill, you know. Uh, so, um, but, you know, that was probably for original music, one of the better uh, things that, that were happening for the, that level, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, um, things have been tough, I think, you know, since after pandemic, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, but I don't think it's just here. Uh, yeah. I think you're probably seeing that, you know. It's every, all over, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's really- it's really worldwide. And, you know, you talk about the pandemic. I'm so glad that bands are out there playing live again. They, they got, even where I'm from in Los Angeles, we have a governor who was being on TV at the time and talking, bragging about the fact that um, as long as I'm in office, um, I'm never going to allow a, another live concert again. And, and thank God it didn't come to that. But, cause, but, but that was the first time, I think, in anybody's eyes where they realized not only that the government could, had that kind of control over us, but... I mean, even as a musician, I imagine um, you, you start to realize at that point, oh, my God, you know, they're trying to take away my way of making a living. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did uh, for me, for the most part, you know, my bands at my level uh, cr- kind of crushed us a bit. You know, uh, the Electric Exorcist, the third record came out to a, a, a horrible thought. Uh, yeah. you know, I have it on sale now if anybody's looking for it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just kidding. But no, I am, you know, but. Anyway, um, you know, we uh, have a song on our new record called uh, Nothing to See. Uh, lyrically, uh, you know, uh, it, it's pretty provocative. It probably speaks a bit about what you were just alluding yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. Um, and so let, let me ask you, so like, um, um, so you, I, I guess like a lot of bands, you probably didn't do a concert for close to two and a half years at least, right? Well, yeah, no, uh, we... We didn't. Yeah, we did a few live streams, uh, you yeah. know, that's, uh, that we found that that was a good way to kind of continue to take yeah, yeah. Of our fans. And we're, we're going to continue to do that. We have a live stream coming up December 16th. Uh, it's going to be like a Christmas live stream. If anybody's wow. interested, we'll be doing that. Uh, and now it's let me ask you, Tony, in regards to the Christmas show, um, have you ever thought of like doing any like, like, like really like Christmas songs or is it going to be just you know, the regular hits. Well, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I can get Nick to play something, you know, really nice or something, you know, yeah. for, it. Uh, you know, I, I know Paul probably knows a bunch of it, yeah. but, you know, possibly, but, you know, we're also playing at Siren Records in Montgomery or uh, McHenry, Illinois on uh, Sunday, the 17th. It's going to be an afternoon. And prior to the show, we have a bunch of friends and people coming out, kids and everything, and we're going to do some Christmas carols as well. So we're going to do a bunch of Christmas that carols. That sounds fun, you know, and, and again, um, it sounds like I'm making a joke, but but I got to tell you, see, the, the, the sad thing is, and, and nothing against um, Mariah Carey, but every year at Christmas, okay, that's the one thing you constantly hear in Mariah Carey's uh, Christmas album, and then you got like, like a lot of the classics, you know, standards like Bing Crosby and all the classic stuff, but... Um, I, I, you know, the last time kind of real rock and thing I remember being put out was Twisted Sisters Christmas album. And, and again, no joke, the funniest thing is prior to that coming out, um, their best selling album was Stay Hungry, the, the album with I Want to Rock, We're Not Going to Take It. Right, right, right. The Christmas album is now their best selling album, if you can yeah. believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Well, look at Trans Siberian Orchestra, you know. Uh, I, I know Chris Caffrey who plays yeah. on the East Coast uh, side of, of it because, you know, they do two of those. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, he he makes his living on that, and then he does his side projects the rest of the year. So, and, and, and I think more more um, rock oriented bands should really think about that. You know, it is one it is just like one time a year. But interesting thing, I know this guy uh, Nick Michaels, the guitar player from his band Corner of the Sanctuary, and for about the last ten years, they put out a new Christmas song every year, and yeah. and then the last year they put like um, a, a whole album of, of these Christmas tunes out. He's telling me the funny thing is, you know, we're a metal band, and so you think you would initially think you might get some backlash for putting out like Christmas type of uh, metal songs. He says, but the funny thing is, a lot of our radio stations—that's the time we get the most airplay—is out of those Christmas songs. 
Well, I know that Mary Xmas, uh, they did a couple of those. And, and yeah. the first two, I think, were pretty good. I mm-hmm. really liked them, you know. Uh, I think they did a third one, I, I think, or maybe I heard something else, but wasn't so good. But I think the first two were great. Yeah, I yeah. Loved these, you know? Now, while we're on the subject of the holidays, you know, Halloween is today. Uh, I was just curious if you're much of a Halloween buff. Do you like to watch horror movies or anything like that? No, I'm not really a big horror movie fan, but we do have some scary videos. You know, uh, I posted, you know, Electric Exorcist, the title track of the third yeah. record. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty scary video. It's fun, you know, um, we had some great yeah. actors and stuff and good Mac makeup, you yeah. know. And then uh, on uh, also on the Electric Exorcist record, uh, Nick and uh, Elvin came out with the song A Book of Secrets about Mary Shelley's book, you yeah. know, Frankenstein. Yeah. So uh, we have our lyric video that's up on that. Okay, well. we'll have to check that out. Maybe when I post an interview, we'll post on the video so people can check this stuff out. Now, since um, you've got um, Phase 4 out, which is the new, newest album, like when you guys go and do these live shows, I was curious, um, how hard is it coming up with a set list? I mean, like, uh, do you do you play just a couple songs off the new album? You try to add them into the set, um, the longer the album is out, or do you play mostly like the hits? Well, what we do is this, is, uh, you know, what, what we, how we've supported Phase 4 is, is that we've come out and we open with Phase 4 and the uh-huh. intro, and then we go right into Nailbiter, which is the single. And that's pretty much the same order they are on the record, two first okay. and second songs. Yeah, yeah. Then we go into the hits. We'll play, uh, like, the popular Electric Exorcist, uh-huh. uh, Heaven on Earth from the Electric Exorcist record. Uh, and then we'll play, you know, Blood of Angels, a title track, which is popular, yeah. as well as, uh, you know, a couple of other tunes. And then we'll end uh, with uh, two or three more of the Phase 4 records. So we kind of bookend it with the new stuff and have the hits in the middle. Oh, that's cool. I, I like that. Now, I was curious, do you guys get much uh, um, of an opportunity to play outside of your local area, Chicago? Well, we- that's where we play most of our stuff is outside the local area. Yeah. Okay. Prior to pandemic, we would do a couple of tours a year, you know, um, and that was, you know, usually Texas and the East Coast and then whatever was in between from Chicago, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, the upper mid, uh, the upper West uh, over there, it was, you know, was t- difficult for us to get to, you know, but, uh, um, but, uh, you know, so yeah, that uh, Chicago, uh, we do, you know, a, a couple local shows are warming up, but for the most part, um, you know, that's where most of our work was done. Okay. Was out. So, um, Tony, before we go, why don't you let people know where they can find you guys on the web? Oh, please, man, come and uh, you can buy anything spillage, but you can see all the history and pictures at our website, which is spillage online dot com spillage dash online dot com lots of cool pictures um also and then you can buy all of our merchandise there also please go to our uh our youtube channel and subscribe got hundreds of live videos and our lyric videos and then our full music videos there and that's at spillage rocks yeah. uh, at, uh you, youtube i guess that's what it is yeah. but it's spillage rocks and subscribe we've got all kinds of cool things happening I will tell you, Tony, with a name like Spillage, you're very lucky because I was it was very easy finding your Facebook page, the band's Facebook page, of course, uh, uh, your personal Facebook page. But with a name like Spillage, oftentimes all kinds of things might come up, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's why Spillage rocks for the YouTube channel and Spillage. And then, if, you know, even if you have any trouble, I'll, my name's Tony Spillman. And yeah. You can find me like oh, you see my picture at the post sure. office. You know, you can, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty easy to find. Just to, you well, know. Tony, I'll tell you what, um, I, I I feel like we're just, you know, getting to know you, but you, you are welcome back at any time, my friend. In fact, I have another show called This Is Metal. We're starting to, you know, wrap things up for this year, but um, we're going to be scheduling shows for next year soon. So when I get ready to do that, I'll reach out to you. And um, before I let you go, I want to thank the Lord of PR, our mutual friend, for setting this up. He's great at what he does. And yeah, yeah. If, it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have um, even known about your band. So. Yeah. Right, yeah, he was pretty adamant that I was didn't miss this one. I was like, "Don't worry, brother, I'm there for you." Well, just yeah. tell him we had a great interview, and I told you you're welcome back anytime. Okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate you too, Jason, and uh, and all the support that you give my band, Philly. I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Take care, my friend. Bye, bye.